Hey, aloha, and welcome to Stan Energy Man here on Think Tech Hawaii. Stan Osterman coming to you live and direct from the, again, super city of Kailua, Hawaii. Um, it's a beautiful day today. In fact, it's kind of one of those, you think it's autumn, but it's still kind of summer. It's a little cool, but it's nice and sunny. Surf's nice. Time to come make your reservations to visit Waikiki and come out and spend some money so our economy can pick back up. It's gotten a pounding in the last year and a half. Anyway, today's show is uh, is really interesting. We have a return guest who's going to, he's working his way into a regular guest, um, probably taking Ryan Wubin's place. I used to have Ryan come on once a month as an electric engineer and explain complicated stuff to us, but uh, he's gotten tied up with other things. And Dan Gowen has, uh, has graciously said, yeah, it's okay to, to lean on him from time to time. And he's he's just such a wealth of knowledge when it comes to overall energy markets and especially hydrogen, uh, which he has um, some specialty in. So today's show, uh, we're going to start off talking a little bit about what I normally call the bane of hydrogen, which is compression. And and Dan's going to ex expand a little bit on that and explain why it, it's such a challenge, which I think would be great for a lot of people out there that, that don't understand why it's such a challenge. And then we're going to talk about some bigger issues in the energy world, and and we'll uh, we'll give you a hint on what's coming up for the rest of the year if you if you don't keep your finger on the pulse of everything energy. So Dan, uh, welcome to the show. Thanks for being on again. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Stan. Welcome to be welcome. Welcome to be back. Great. So it's uh it's all yours now. You can uh, <laughs> jump into that presentation, which I think will be enlightening for everybody. Sure. If I can get to get you to place uh, slide number one up, please. All right, I'm just starting off with a sort of a, a demo for the company. I had to make sure I put the uh, web address up there, make my CEO happy. So slide, slide number two, please. So uh, what that is, is, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm starting the story in the middle here, and I've got a reason for, for doing this. Uh, what, what you're looking at is that's an ASME certified pressure vessel. It's certified to 5100 bar. Uh, it's a cracker unit from an oil refinery. Uh, it's made of stainless steel. It has a 316 stainless steel liner. It's a 15,000 liter tank. The reason why I'm putting that uh, that on the screen there for everybody to see is remember last time we talked about these uh, megawatt grid scale electrolysizers that produce for one megawatt hour of electricity produce 22 kilograms of hydrogen. At 20 bar, that's 13,200 liters. So 13,200 liters will fit inside that 15,000 liter tank. So that gives you an idea of how much gas, whatever compressor you're going to throw at this, uh, uh, that uh, it, it's going to have to compress. Now, the reason why I'm pointing this out is 22 kilograms of hydrogen. Now, a, a Toyota Mirai car usually hold about six kilograms of hydrogen. So that's, that's a little over, that's not quite four cars worth of, worth of fuel up, the tank fill up. But that gives you an idea how much gas that you're going to have to compress. Uh, so when you talk to anybody, keep that in mind, because a lot of the compressor technology out there, if you ask them what the displacement is, they'll say it's like four liters or 10 liters or something like that. When I look at Lind or Hopper or any of those companies that make these compressors that uh, compress hydrogen, they're pretty notorious for being really, really small. And when you see how much volume that compressor has to compress down, you quickly realize that you're going to spend a lot of time, a lot of horsepower, and a lot of energy trying to compress this gas. Okay. Before you move Can on to, to the next slide, number three, please. Be before you move on to the next slide, I want you to say again. I know you mentioned it, but you said that 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 um, vessel that was on that trailer was how many bar? Well, it it it's an ASME certified pressure vessel. It's certified for a maximum of 5,100 bar. That's okay. like 80, 88,000 PSI. Again, yeah. That's what I wanted people to understand. Yeah. 88,000 PSI. Now, 88,000 PSI, if you think a scuba tank is high pressure, it's 2,500 PSI. That, yeah. that vessel is 88,000 PSI. So that's the, that's the volumes that we're talking about and the pressures. Right, the volumes and the pressure. So what, at a cracker unit, what they use that for is they put heavy crude oil in there they heat that tank up to several thousand degrees. They pump nitrogen in there. They use heat and pressure to break the long molecules of oil down into smaller molecules, okay? 
And once they've done that, then they inject hydrogen into that tank and that reacts with the sulfur, forms uh, hydrogen sulfide. They burn the hydrogen sulfide because that's a poisonous gas into sulfur dioxide, run it through a catalyst, some water, and that's sulfuric acid, which happens to be battery acid, the kind for your lead acid battery, uh, battery in your car. That's where one of the byproducts in the oil refinery happens to be battery acid. But, uh, but that, that device is in every, uh, every refinery. Usually the manufacturer that uh, builds those, they certify those to last for 20 to 30 years. So that's a pretty tough piece of metal. I don't know how many people have told me that, Dan, what you're talking about is impossible. I'm like, really? Have you talked to the guys at the oil refinery? <laughs> Cause don't they call that a cat stuff. cracker? Cat cracker. That's it. Exactly. Okay. That's exactly what it's called. Yep. Slide number three, please. Okay. So there is a paper that uh, Dr. Justin Johnson and I wrote a couple of years ago called Hydrogen Compressors are not Match Not Made in Head. So if you go out to our website and, and there's a way to contact us, we can send you a copy uh, of that paper. Anybody wants to get a hold of it. And I know, Stan, you've got a copy of it also. Uh, but what's on that, uh, on that paper and what that image there is, there's an image of a, pit, of a piston and a reciprocating compressor. So if you look closely there, you can see there's a crankshaft, a piston, an inlet valve, an outlet valve, and so forth. So what the story here is, and I'm and here's how I'm going to explain what the problem is, and that is you're trying to build a wall of bowling balls to hold back sand. I'll say that again. You're trying to build a wall made out of bowling balls to hold back sand. And what I'm talking about is the bowling balls, those are the iron atoms in the sand. Those are hydrogen molecules. That's how tiny the hydrogen molecule is. In fact, if you look at the space between your piston and your cylinder wall to the hydrogen molecule, that is the Grand Canyon. And to make matters worse, uh, there's this effect called the Bernoulli effect. And what it is, is the compression ring. If you look at that piston, there's a groove around the edge of that, that piston. Right, and that's for a compression ring, and that's supposed, supposedly that's to seal the space between the piston and the cylinder wall. But the problem is the hydrogen molecule is so tiny it'll fit between the compression ring and the cylinder wall. And when you've got that piston moving really quickly, the Bernoulli effect. And I know Stan, you're a pilot, so you know how how air and gases move over the wing of an airplane. Well, that Bernoulli effect will funnel lots and lots of hydrogen right past your compression ring. Okay, so. There's that. And then the other thing, and since you've got that problem with your compression rings, your input valve and your input, your output valve, you'll never be able to grind those surfaces smooth enough to keep uh, those sealed from the hydrogen gas. Okay. The next thing uh, we talk about is the displacement. And I'll, I'll give you an example when I talk about displacement. So uh, I've got a Ford Ranger pickup truck and uh, in that truck, is an internal combustion engine. I burn gasoline in it, so I'm a bad guy because I burn gasoline in my, my truck. But that engine is a six-cylinder engine, and the displacement is four liters. Okay, think about that, four liters. And so, therefore, what an internal combustion engine is a form of reciprocating compressor. So whatever compressor you're using, four liters, can you imagine dividing four into 13,200? So that'll give you an idea how many uh, how many cycles that engine would have to go through just to move 13,200 liters of volume. Now, why hydrogen occupies that much space, we're going to talk about some of the issues with hydrogen and the charges and so forth of why it occupies a lot of space. So if I can get you to move to uh, slide number four, please. Okay, and this one will probably be on for a little while. So I'm brittle to distraction. So on that, you got the top and the bottom. So the top, the top there. Well, first of all, there's a company over in Germany called Hohinger Burger Compressor Tech. It's a German company, and what you're seeing up there, and you see that gentleman standing right next to it, that is a the head of a giant industrial compressor. That's just the head. Understand that that huge cylinder right there, that uh, those protrusions you see, those are actually valve covers. It, inside there's a compressor the displacement's 10 liters and usually these compressors will have six to eight cylinders and that uh, head right there is tied to a common crankshaft and a great big huge motor sometimes they use a diesel engine or a jet engine sometimes even an induction motor usually if it's an induction motor this is the type of device it'll suck down between six and ten million watts per hour just trying to move this huge machine now 
if you're compressing natural gas or carbon dioxide or anything like that, that's a wonderful machine. It's from the age of steam. It's been around for a hundred years. There's a lot of really great companies that, that build these things, okay? It's just that this machine is completely inappropriate for compressing hydrogen. Now, the issues with hydrogen on the left upper left-hand screen there, you can see that, that head there that's been destroyed. It only takes hydrogen about two years to destroy that compressor head. That's hydrogen embrittlement. Now, as to what causes it, it's a combination of that tiny little molecule and the fact that when you compress gases, they get really hot. So down in the bottom left-hand corner there, there's a molecular model of titanium at the molecular level. And on the right-hand side, that star David, you see it right, right there, that is an X-ray diffraction of 316 stainless steel. So years ago, when I asked to investigate this, what I did was the National Institute of Standards Technology, they have this database. And so I took this thing, I downloaded it, put it in a Hadoop cluster, I data mined it, and I came back with a list of things that seemed to be impervious to hydrogen. Now, at the time, I was working at Eli Lilly, and through the grace of Eli Lilly, Lilly has um, a relationship uh, with Fermi National Labs up in Chicago, and they have a synchrotron, it's a big atom smasher. The only one larger is CERN over in Europe. One of the things things that Fermi National Lab does, Lilly sends them samples of molecules, and Fermi does these x-ray diffractions. They take pictures of actual atoms and sends it back to Lilly. And then Lilly compares it with their molecular models to say, okay, do these molecules actually look like what we think they look like in our computer models, okay? Well, Lilly let me send up to Fermi uh, basically samples of all these things that are impervious to hydrogen. They let me send up samples of things that I knew were impervious to hydrogen. I sent Send up samples of things I destroyed with hydrogen, and I also sent up some samples of some things that I things that are supposedly impervious to hydrogen, and got some pictures of those. So I had four sets. It took them about four and a half months. They sent me back a flash drive, and I compared all these pictures, and I and it became very apparent what's occurred. So if I could get you to show slide number four one more time, okay. So what's going on? The difference is the difference between the the boxes and the triangle. And that is the materials that are impervious to hydrogen, the atoms are actually connected together in triangles. The materials that are not impervious to hydrogen, the atoms are actually hooked together in boxes, boxes or five atoms or six atoms, whatever. What happens is the hydrogen molecule is so small, it'll jam itself between the molecules and through Brownian motion, that means hot, hot gas, just vibrant from compressing it, just the vibrational energy alone breaks atomic uh, breaks atomic bonds. So hydrogen has the ability to break atomic bonds. Now, nothing else has that ability. Now, you, you kind of have to ask the question, why? why? Why is this happening? And the reason why is because hydrogen sits on a boundary between the atomic world and the quantum world. It sits on a place in, in, uh, in the world of quantum mechanics is truly a really strange place. And if you get a bunch of physicists in a room, if you want to start, if you want to get them arguing, start talking about quantum mechanics. Okay. Now, as far as the materials that are impervious to hydrogen, I'm going to go ahead and give you the three metallic alloy families. It's a short list. Okay. And the stainless steel family, it's 303, 306, 316 stainless steel. 316 stainless steel is the same stainless steel that's used in knives, forks, spoons, utensils, that kind of stuff. Again, that's 303, 306, 316 stainless steel. The next one are your coppers, your copper family. And that is copper, brass, bronze, beryllium, copper. Again, that's copper, brass, bronze, beryllium, copper. The third one happens to be your aluminum alloys. Now, there's a couple notes about the aluminum alloys. You have to keep your temperatures below 100 degrees Celsius because there's chemistry above, above the boiling temperature of water. Now, um, about the uh, aluminum alloys, there needs to be a lot more work done on this. And the reason why is because there are some aluminum alloys that have tensile strengths greater than titanium, but we I don't have any good test data on them. The reason why I'm interested in, them, in those metals is because it really helps me out with my work, right? Um, the last one, the last two are the different plastic families. And the two plastic families are your polycarbonates and your high-density polyethylene plastics. Okay, and it has to do with just the plain density of those materials and the fact that those plastics are not adulterated with chlorine, sulfur, fluorine, 
or any other, that those are true hydrocarbon type materials and how, and how the atoms are actually uh, put together. So now it shouldn't be any surprise that those materials are on those lists considering if you look at the, any of the manufacturers that make carbon fiber bottles, use either they use aluminum liners or they use stainless steel liners and they always use high density polythene plastic on the inside of their carbon fiber bottle. So, so it shouldn't be any surprise. So if I can get you to go to slide number five, please. So I'm going to talk about uh, an interesting subject in physics, and it's I'm, I'm going to, it's something that most people don't know. So what I've got sitting there in front of me is a distribution transformer, and that's one of those things that you usually see attached to a telephone pole. And what I want to talk about actually is those bushings there on the top, those high voltage bushings. So bushing to bushings about 14,400 volts, from the bushing down to the casing is about 7,200 volts. Now. If you notice those insulators are shaped sort of like an accordion, okay, that's intentional. What it is, is electrons like to travel along the surfaces of things, between things. So between the air and the actual insulator itself where the electrons actually travel. Because there's because the molecules don't exactly come up flush against the surface of the insulator. So that's where the electrons like to travel. And so by having that accordion shape, you actually increase the surface area the electrons have to travel to uh, to ground out on that uh, that casing there. So if I can get you to move down number five. So I've got a group of five things in that picture. Now, uh, you know, you're going to say, well, okay, why, why did he put all five of those things in there? Well, all five of those devices are what we call quantum devices. Now, this is all going to lead up into what we're going to talk to, how to compress this gas, Okay. Well, the first thing we can talk to the device, the device up in the top left-hand corner is a diode. The next one there in the middle is called an MPN transistor or bipolar junction transistor. The device there at the bottom is called the MOSFET, which is metal oxide semiconductor field effect transistor, versus a proton exchange membrane hydrogen fuel cell and a proton exchange membrane electrolysis. All those devices have things in common, has to do with quantum physics. In the case of a diode, uh, when they first discovered semiconductors, you usually start, start out with germanium, and they sw quickly switched over to silicon. Uh, what silicon, silicon is a semiconductor, meaning it, it can conduct or be an insulator, and usually they'll add something to it, an impurity to it, to make it either positively charged or negatively charged. When you sandwich those two pieces together, you get this what's called a boundary effect. In the case of a diode, what it means is electrons can only travel in one direction through that device. In the case of the transistor, they've taken three of these materials, sandwiched them together, you have two boundaries, and that middle boundary there acts like a gate or a control valve. The device below there is called a field effect transistor, and that device uses something called, it's called quantum tunneling, and quite literally that's an effect where uh, they can use a charge plate next to a junction, and you can actually cause what they call basically an electron jumping from one side of that barrier to the other. In the proton exchange membrane fuel cell, they describe the membrane as proton exchange membrane. But the truth is, is that boundary actually has more in common with the quantum device and quantum tunnel because when a hydrogen atom flows through it, goes through um, car a carbon fiber membrane, the platinum strips the electron off of the hydrogen molecule and you've got a, a proton and that proton disappears on one side of the membrane and reappears on the other side. Okay, and that's called quantum tunnel. Now, the slide number seven, please. So I realize that uh, a lot of the people in the hydrogen universe will think this is a little strange, this whole idea of quantum tunneling and quantum mechanics. But that equation you see right there, the Schrodinger equation, that's been argued about since Albert Einstein's time and Albert Einstein passed in 1955. And the Schrodinger equation still rules supreme. And as a testament to the effects of quantum tunneling, if the effect did not exist, your cell phones would not work and these laptops would not work either. So without that effect. So obviously it does work and obviously hydrogen fuel cells do work. Uh, the last page ought to be slide number eight. And that's the record that I set in my lab, uh, June 10th of 2021, that's 50, 7,579 PSI compressing hydrogen. I blew out a coupling and I'm in need of a, a master machinist and I got through my presentation stand. <laughs> the, the, the bane of hydrogen 
um, as far as moving forward in our future is compression. Yeah. And, and I think what you just explained, what well, certainly cleared up a lot of things in my mind, um, not that I understand all the physics details, but certainly I understand why it's a challenge. And I've always known about invertilment, and I've always known that it was not only pressure related, but temperature related. But, you know, what you went through makes it a lot clearer. I also understand the boundary thing from aviation, because one of the things that's fairly new in the aviation wing technology is called boundary layer separation, where they actually inject like bypass air from the engine through tiny, tiny holes on the wing to separate the, 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 the surface of the wing from yep. the air passing by it. And it actually reduces resistance, therefore less drag, therefore more efficient wing. So so the, the concept you're talking about, even though I haven't, I mean, I can't put them all together because I'm not a physicist, they start to make sense to me. And I'm, I'm encouraged that at some point in the not too distant future, I'll be able to really get a good grasp, grasp on all this. Well, I, I also know that people are going to play these videos multiple times. They're going to unwrap a lot of the things that I've said too. So the next time we get together, I'll show you how to build uh, a, a, a check valve that's molecularly tied at the quantum level, and it is a quantum device. And I'll also show you how to use the quantum physics to compress the gas. And not only that, but the device uh, that you'll end up using, well, basically I'm going to use that great big tank to compress the gas. And I'll use the hydrogen itself to compress itself. Right Correct. now, that sounds fantastic. But when I sit there and talk about quantum, I'm telling you, understand 75 years ago, Albert Einstein thought this was focus, focus too. But look at all the computers and semiconductors that are built upon that concept of quantum tunneling. And the quantum world is truly, truly bizarre. And, and hydrogen definitely violates a lot of physics. I guess we could say it violates the laws of physics, but more accurately, what it probably is, we just don't understand the universe well enough. So that's good. Uh, I, don't, I don't feel quite as ignorant as I thought I was because. It's still a mysterious world in a lot of ways, including with physics. I tell well, people, you know, a lot of Einstein's work is still called theory, and that's for a reason. Um, there's people that have string theory of, phys of quantum physics and all other kinds of, you know, ways that are different from the way Einstein viewed it. It just so happens that a lot of his stuff lines up with what we can experience and see. So we tend to put a lot of, of uh, trust in it, but it doesn't mean we completely understand it. I, I've had the honor in my life to actually help prove some of his theories when I worked on GPS because the GPS satellites, the Navistar GPS satellites, have a cesium clock in them. And I was able to, we were able to prove that the, the GPS satellites at time truly does run faster in the GPS satellites than it does here, down here on Earth. And that the gravity actually warps time and space and we're able to prove it. So I was actually honored that when, we, when I was developing GPS, we helped prove some of the theories that Albert Einstein put out. So. I appreciate cool you stuff. sharing sharing that insight with us. And, you know, we have a, a few more minutes left. And, and you know, you and I talk a lot online and, and chatting and stuff on the text messaging. Um, let's talk a little bit about kind of the perfect storm we have coming up in the energy world. Um, if you can if you can do that in like five minutes or less. Well, I'll, I'll try. And I think a lot of people have been talking about there's a it's not quite the energy world, but it's a uh, it has to do with something called Evergrande. It's a property developer there in China. And one of the things that's been going on in China for a very long time, and Stan and I, you and I have been throwing about videos and stuff uh, about some of the really bad property development that's been going on in China for quite a while. But they have a 30-year speculative bubble, and it's pretty bad. I mean, it's not just the ghost cities. There are actually videos out there of 30- and 40-story buildings collapsing and killing people. That's how bad these things are. Well, this uh, Evergrande company um, is uh, basically declared, declared bankruptcy the 24th of uh, September, and they have 30 days net due to make good on their debts, and they can't. Now, Wall Street wants them bailed out, but Xi Jinping's not going to for a lot of different reasons. Part of it has to do with politics. The last three years, he's clamped down on corruption, and China has been turning into kind of a hermit state. Basically, look kind of like North Korea. Unfortunately, that's what's been going on. And as part of that stamping down on corruption, he's definitely been stamping down on some of the bad proper development there. The other side of it is, is he simply doesn't have the cash reserves to do it. 
with the, the, what's been going on with COVID and so forth. There's an energy crisis going on in China uh, because of some conflicts they have with the Australians, right? The Australians have jacked the price of coal 300%. They can't buy iron ore. Uh, some of the, the coal mines in China, they've had some pretty severe storms and it rained out their coal mines. So they're having blackouts, rolling blackouts going on in China right now. The Chinese haven't been able to fire up the, the factories. And of course, we've got all the problems with importing goods here in the States and so forth. So they don't have cash flow burn coming in. And the COVID situation is pretty much deleted in the ca of cash, now, of dollars mainly. Now, the reason why it's important in dollars is China imports more than 60% of their food. And they definitely are a large importer of, of crude oil and a lot of their other energy supplies. So Xi Jinping's in a situation where if he bails out Evergrande, and you know we're talking about three hundred billion dollars, right? Uh, that's going to hamper his ability to buy food and fuel for his people. So the Wall Streeters want him to bail out, but the truth he can't politically. You know he might end up being on the casualty list if he did. Now as far as the uh, Wall Street's concerned, why they're so concerned about it uh, in the street and amongst the financial community, and especially amongst some of the big hedge funds. They describe it as a dumpster fire. And basically what the idea is, they've taken all these bonds, thrown in a big dumpster, you set it on fire, and you got a rolling fire, right? And come the 23rd, which is Saturday, they're going to roll that into a building full of dumpsters full of that's been stoked up with gasoline. And if you want to know what that proverbial or that, uh, um, that symbolic building is, it's called HSBC, the big bank in Hong Kong. And whenever that fire starts burning, that's about that'll roll through the world's derivative markets, and that's about three hundred trillion dollars. You know this. This is um, really, really a scary time, <clears throat> and I think the only reason it's not scary to most people is they they don't have a economic background. My unfortunate self had to go through a master's program in a through a university that all my electives were economics and. I hate economics, but I was forced to go through the classes. And now I'm scared to death every time I, I open up a you know, Wall Street Journal or, or I, I listen to what's going on with uh, Evergrande. But, um, you know, we, we've already hit our time limit. And, you know, I'm, I'm going to have to have you back again, fortunately, because I, uh, I think we need to make this a regular thing. You're very I, enlightening. I, and, I, uh, I think you're right. I think we're going to make it, you know, just so everybody through when I talk about $300 trillion, the United States, we only have 20, our GDP is 20 trillion a year, guys. Yeah. So nobody can bail this out is what I'm trying to tell you. I truly I wish too it were big, a different story. Yeah. Too big to bail. Not like the uh, real estate uh, bubble we had a couple of years ago. Yeah. Not, not only that, but the CCP can't because of political politics inside of China, they can't bail it out. Yeah. You know, capitalists right, are evil in China, unfortunately. Oh. Well, thanks so much again for being on the show. I really appreciate it. And uh, we'll have you, I'm going to probably have you back in like two weeks just so we can do a Monday morning quarterback of what's going on around the world economically and, uh, and talk a little bit more about hydrogen. So thanks again. And um, I appreciate it. And we'll have to have you back. Well, I appreciate your time, Stan. All right. Aloha to everyone. And thanks for uh, watching Stan Energy Man. I hope you'll, uh, you'll really get something from this, uh, this segment because uh, I certainly did. And uh, I appreciate Dan coming on and sharing with us. So until next Tuesday, Stan, Energy Man signing off. Aloha.